As you're seated, if you would take your Bible and turn with me to 1 Corinthians. We're going to pick up in chapter 12, beginning in verse 31, and then read through chapter all of chapter 13. Now, this is a Sunday morning. This is not a Saturday afternoon wedding. We are going to get 1 Corinthians 13. Now, what's happening here in 1 Corinthians 13 is Paul has spent a good part of chapter 12 explaining about the gifts that the Spirit gives each believer, that he knits them together as a body, that they're all gifted differently, that they, they all serve together as many members, but, but all together in one body in Jesus. And, and yet, as we come into chapter 3, Paul is going to tell them there's something better than gifts, that there is a better way. So Paul writes, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 31, But earnestly desire the higher gifts, And I will show you a still more excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all faith so as to even remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth that love bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man... I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. I'll never forget when I was probably sixth or seventh grade, I was on a youth trip, I was with our youth group. I don't remember where we were. I think I've blocked out certain parts of this memory from my mind. And we were somewhere and there was a guest preacher and he was preaching about the word of God and how God speaks to us in his word. And and he was saying, only does God speak to us generally, but uh, as he went on, he was saying, God speaks to us specifically that when you open up God's word, that that he he wants to, by the Holy Spirit, speak to you. And I remember towards the end of his message, as he began to preach, he, he took his Bible and he began to to just rip out large chunks of the Bible and to, to toss it on the floor around him. And I remember even thinking as a sixth grader, this is weird. I don't know that he should be doing this. And he, he's ripping out these pages. And, and so by the end of his message, he has all these pages of the Bible scattered around his feet. And, and his invitation was, he said, I want each of you to get up and to come and to pick up a, a page of Scripture, to come and pick up a piece of the Bible. And this is God's message for you. Whatever page you pick up, you just come and pick the first one you come to, and God is speaking to you through this. I didn't know any better. I, and also I figured somebody's got to pick this up. So at the time, we all got up, and we came, and I got my, my piece of the Bible, and I went and I sat back down. And you know, being middle schoolers, as soon as this, this service was over, what do you all want to know? Everybody's gathered together, and they want to know, well, what's your say? Right, what, what passage did you get? So we're gathered and we're saying, well, what passage did you get? And this guy said, well, you know, I got Philippians 4. And this one says, well, I got, I got a piece of John's gospel. And this one says, well, I got a, a large chunk of Psalm 119. And everybody's getting these beautiful passages from God. And so they finally turned to me and they said, well, Chris, what passage did you get? Well, I didn't want to tell them what passage I got. I got 2 Samuel 13. If you're not familiar with 2 Samuel 13, it is where Amnon assaults his sister Tamar and then is subsequently murdered by his other brother Absalom. <laughs> this was the one I got. I said, well, Chris, well, what passage did you get? And I don't remember. I don't remember. Like, what do you mean you don't remember? It just happened. What, what passage did you get? Like, you know, it's already it's in my pocket. I just don't want to go back and get it out. I gotta, I gotta, no, really, what passage did you get? What was God's message to you? Well, mainly that this was a silly exercise, right? <laughs> that, you, that you should always care about context. 
think about that story when I, I come to 1 Corinthians 13. We talk here at Buckrun a lot about context. If you've been here long at all, you know that Dr. York always says that context is everything, that context matters. That most of the time when we see this passage read, we, we hear it read uh, rightly so in weddings. This passage was read at my own wedding. That this, this chapter 13 is maybe the most beautiful thing ever written about love. That, that sometimes I think that in our eagerness to see this applied to marriage, to see this applied to romantic love, we have divorced it from its context and we miss part of what Paul is actually saying to us. Now, we must admit that 1 Corinthians 13 has much to say about marriage, that all of our marriages would be better off if we lived this way, if this sort of love characterizes our marriage. But what I want you to see here is that what Paul is primarily speaking about in 1 Corinthians 13 is not love that only pertains to married people or people in romantic relationships, but instead Paul is speaking to something that pertains to every member of the body. He's not talking about marriage. He's talking about love in the body, how to use the gifts in the body. That last week, we, our pastor called us to pour out our lives for the sake of the gospel, to pour out our lives, to use our gifts, to see people come to know Jesus. And Paul says, if you're going to use your gifts, if you're going to pour out your life, if you're going to be a member of the body, Paul says, I want you to pour out your life, but I want to show you there's a better way. And so Paul is calling us here to love that he's demonstrating to us that there is a better way than simply grasping for the gifts, but instead Paul is calling us, the the first Corinthians and us together by the Holy Spirit, to follow the more excellent way. And that way is love. But Paul says that what what is necessary for the life to live together in a body, as each member is gifted differently and is united together in the body of Christ, is that we must love. This is for every member. Married, single, widowed, and in every other circumstance imaginable, this is the call for every Christian to follow the more excellent way, to follow the way of love. And so I want you to see Paul doesn't just call them to follow the more excellent way, but he begins to say, I will show you the more excellent way. That this is what it looks like to begin to love this way. And so what I want to do as we work through this passage today is call us all to say, this is the way of love. Let's follow it together. Let's press in in the Lord that we might be together as the body of Christ. Look at the way he he structures this text. The the first thing he's calling us to do is to prioritize motive over action. The the, the first three uh, verses there form a a section in which Paul is speaking of the necessity of love. That he says here that prioritize motive over action. That your love, your heart matters more than what you do. He, he uses the, the image of the gifts, right? He, speaking in tongues or, or prophetic powers or knowledge or faith. He, he speaks about these gifts which the Corinthians are fighting over and jealous that some have these gifts and others don't have these gifts. And, and Paul says, I want to show you there's a better way. That more than your gifts, more than what you do, your motive, your heart, your love matters more. And look at what he says. That first he says that words without love are grating. That they're annoying, that they're of no use. He says, if I were to speak in the tongue of angels, of men or of angels. Now I want you to hear, Paul is using hyperbolic language. This this isn't an admission that Paul speaks in tongues or that Paul speaks in the language of angels. That Paul is saying, if I could speak in the most heavenly form of words imaginable. Even if I did speak in the tongues of men or of angels. If I had the highest speech possible, but did not have love. He says, I'm a, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. That words without love are are grating. They're not just unhelpful, they are annoying. That your words in the body will not edify the body without love. You can say the right thing, but say it in the wrong way and say it without love and actually do much damage. You know this if you're married. Right? Most of your conflicts come not from what you say, but from how you say it. A few years ago, our, our uh, daughter, I think it was on her birthday, uh, Scott Reeson, one of our pastors, bought her for her birthday this, this electronic dog guitar. Uh, is the when you would play it, he would like, arr, arr, he would howl. Or if you're in here, Scott, thank you for that, for putting that in our home. It was the sort of gift that the moment as she's opening it, that like you begin to see what it is, and as she's opening, I'm immediately having a clock in my head, like how long before I can take the batteries out of this thing without causing a fit? Like how long before I can get this thing in my house? That even as it stayed in her house for a long time, that as it began to die, as the batteries in it began to die, it would randomly howl at night. You just would hear, it was the worst. It just, just grated on your ears. Paul says, you can have all the best words. You can know all the right things to say, but if you don't have love, your words are grating. They're useless. 
pointless. They serve nobody. Your gifts are useless without love. Second thing he says is not just words, but knowledge. That words without love are grating, but knowledge without love is foolish. Again, he uses hyperbolic language. If I had prophetic powers to understand all mysteries and all knowledge, or I had all faith. Now, even uh, prophets in the Old Testament didn't have all knowledge. They didn't have all understanding of all mysteries. And so Paul is saying, even if I had the greatest knowledge possible, had, had all the faith in the world to move mountains, even if I had the greatest knowledge imaginable, but if I did not have love, I'm nothing. Now notice there that Paul just doesn't say that, that he would have nothing. Paul says, I am nothing without love. That knowledge without love makes you a fool. You can know all the right answers. You can know all the, the theological statements that you want. But Paul says, without love, your gifts are useless. You become a fool. That your knowledge makes you nothing. In, in high school, I really got into the game Trivial Pursuit. Anybody play Trivial Pursuit? Good. There are some fellow nerds here, right? We, I love Trivial Pursuit, really enjoy it. You know, it's a trivia game where you have to answer all these random questions. You get a little pie, and every time you get an answer right, there's a lot of joy. You get to put a little <laughs> colored piece in the pie. And I really enjoyed Trivial Pursuit, and I actually got pretty good at it. And, and I always felt really good about the fact that I was good at Trivial Pursuit. And, and I enjoyed this for years until one day the actual name of the game began to dawn on me. Trivial Pursuit, the useless, pointless pursuit. When you win Trivial Pursuit... You're essentially saying, I know more things that don't matter than anybody else. <laughs> I, I've, I've won at a pointless game that affects no one. But it is a truly a trivial pursuit. It is trivia that doesn't really matter. And Paul says, you can know everything there is to know. You can have all knowledge. You can have every correct answer of the Bible. You could have the Bible memorized. You can have all the knowledge that it is possible to have. And yet, without love, you're fooled. That your love is what makes your knowledge useful. It's not the gifts that matter, it's love. It's not just words. Words without love are great. Knowledge without love makes you a fool. But, but it goes even further that sacrifice without love is empty. He says, if I could make the greatest sacrifice, if I could give everything that I have away, and even not just give everything I have away, I could give up my own body. I could be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I could go into the fire, give up my body to be burned, die for the sake of the gospel. I could give up everything there is to sacrifice, but if I have not love, it's empty. I have gained nothing. That your sacrifice made to Christ is empty. It is in vain. It is foolish without love. You can give the biggest offering. You can sacrifice the most time. You could even move to another country and die for preaching the gospel. And Paul says, if you do it without love, it is nothing. Paul's teaching us here that love is essential to what it means to be a believer. It is essential to what it means to be in the body. That love takes our seemingly insignificant service, our meager offerings to the Lord, and love infuses it with meaning and significance and weight. In Luke 21, Jesus is with his disciples and they're, they're watching the rich people come and very loudly put their offerings in the offering plate and making a big deal about how much they're giving. And then if you remember the story, there's a widow that comes and she gives two small coins. And what does Jesus say to his disciples? He stops them and he points her out and he says, I tell you, she's given more than all of them. For they gave out of their abundance, but she gave out of what she had. That her offering is great. Not because it has great monetary value, but because it is infused with love. That what matters in the kingdom, the measurement of service in the kingdom is not applause, is not dollar amounts, is not pats on the back. The measurement of service in the kingdom is love. It's not just what do you say or what do you know or what have you given up. It's what do you love? Where is your love? Every week when we come in here, we come and if you're like me, you come and you take your kids over to kids ministry. And you drop them off and you're able to go to Sunday school and you come in here and you, you worship. You're, you hear the Bible read, you hear the Bible preach, you spend time, and, and maybe you don't even think about what's happening in kids' ministry. Maybe that's just your kids, like you're happy to, um, they're their problem now, you're dropping them off. But I want you to know that so much of what has to happen in order for, for kids' ministry to happen on Sunday mornings, you're never going to see. You're never going to know all the work that goes into serving you and your families, that you might be able to worship, that you might be able to hear the word, that your kids might be able to learn. You'll never know all that goes into that, right? 
that, that they do that, all those who serve our kids that, that way, all those who serve faithfully there do it not because they're getting paid for it, not because they, they're getting applause for it, not because you're going to know their name or they're going to receive earthly rewards, or it, because it even seems significant to the world. No, they serve because they love Jesus and they love your kids. And so the love that they have takes their work and infuses it with meaning and significance. So they wipe noses and change diapers and sing songs and read the Bible and teach your children about Jesus because they love you. And more importantly, they love, they love Jesus. Paul says that love is essential to what it means to be a believer. It is essential to life in the body. That more than your gifts, we need your love. Paul says, we'll take whatever gift you got. The Spirit has gifted you all in different ways. But we must have your love. We need your love to make it as a body. You can have the greatest voice and sing all the right songs and sing them beautifully. But without the love of Jesus, you are just a noise. You can teach every class there is to teach. You can preach every sermon. You can answer every question there is to be answered. But without love, you are a fool. You can give the biggest offering there is to give today. You can sponsor every student on their trip to Kenya. You can do that, by the way, if you want to do that. You can go to Kenya, you can die in another country for the sake of the gospel. And yet without love, it all is empty and meaningless. But Paul says that love prioritizes motive, love, heart over action. It's not what we do, it's what we love. So the question becomes, what does this actually look like, Paul? How do we actually do this, this way of love? What is it, how does it work out in our life? And so we, we move into to verses 4 through 7, this second, second section of the text. In which Paul is telling us, giving us a picture, here's what this love looks like. Love is essential to life in the body, and here is what it looks like, that love prefers others over self. Now, I want you to notice here a few things. First, this is not a definition of love. It is more a description of love. It's not a, a holistic list that there are more things that could be said, but, but Paul is here describing love, and notice he, he personifies it. He describes love as if it were a person. Describing both the things love does and, interestingly enough, the thing love doesn't do. That for us broken people, sometimes it's easier to understand what love is by understanding what love is not. So Paul here is is describing love for us, saying this is what love looks like. You need this love in the body to to work together, to to be together in the body of Christ. So what does it look like, Paul? Paul says, here's what it looks like. First, you must die to self. This is a nearly impossible list to summarize, but if there is one thread that I can thread throughout all of this, is that love requires that you die to self. That to prefer others over self means that you die to self, that you no longer live for your own self, but instead you live for the life of others. This list in many ways is both simple and self-explanatory, but yet difficult to practice. But Paul says, let's work through it, Paul says love is patient. Love is not impatient. Love is patient, that love considers others' time more important than themselves. That's what impatience is. Impatience is a statement that my time in life and preferences are more important than yours. Paul says, no, love is patient. And love is kind. Love has a general compassion towards other people. Love recognizes the dignity and the worth of every human being made in the image of God. You want to see if you're kind? Don't look at how you treat people who can do things for you. Look at how you treat people who you feel like can do nothing for you. How do you treat the people who wait on you at restaurants, check you out at Kroger? How do you treat the people who you would normally not look at? Love is kind. It recognizes and celebrates dignity and worth and respect in every person made in the image of God. Love does not envy or boast. In other words, love is not angry about what God has given you nor prideful about what God has given me. That those who had some gifts were, were in the church of Corinth prideful that God had given them the higher gifts and others were envious that God had given that God. God had given them those gifts and not themselves. And Paul says, love does not envy. Love's not angry about what God has given you. I rejoice in the gifts God has given you. And love does not boast. Love is not prideful about the gifts that God has given me. It's not envious. It does not boast. It is not arrogant. It's the word he uses multiple times in this letter. Love is not puffed up. It does not have a, a, an importance about itself, a, a false view of importance about itself. That, that we, we would talk about humility to say humility is not necessarily thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Paul says love isn't puffed up. It doesn't view itself arrogantly. Love is not rude. The word he uses there literally is love does not act unhonorably, dishonorably towards other people. It's the same word he uses back in chapter 7 
when he, he's speaking to men and saying, if you feel like your passions are burning within you and you feel that you are going to act dishonorably towards your betrothed, don't let your passions burn, just wed, just be married. And now Paul says, love doesn't act dishonorably. That love isn't rude, it doesn't elbow its way in. Love acts proper, love seeks the good of others. That love does not insist on its own way. Love willingly lays aside its preferences and does not demand that everything happens according to its own desire. Love is not irritable or resentful. Love is not easily offended. Love is not thin-skinned. Love doesn't go looking for reasons to be offended and to take offense. And when there is real reason for offense, love is not resentful. Some of your, your Bibles may some, say something like, love does not count up the wrong. So what Paul is literally saying, love doesn't count up the bad. Love, do, love doesn't keep a record of grievances so that every time there is a new grievance, it gets added to the top of the list and the list gets heaped upon the offender. Paul says love is not irritable and it keeps no record of wrong. It does not count up the bad. But instead, love rejoices, not, does not rejoice with wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. A couple things we might say here. One, we have to recognize that love never rejoices in what dishonors God. Love always rejoices with the truth, not at wrongdoing. Love does not rejoice in sin, but instead rejoices with righteousness. Rejoices with the right things, but even more than that, that love does not find joy at finding wrong. You've been around somebody that they seem to take a certain sense of satisfaction and joy in pointing out the wrong things in other people's lives or places. That love does not run a discernment blog. Love does not find joy in pointing out the wrong in other people's lives. But instead, love rejoices with the truth. Where love finds the truth, it rejoices. Always with the right things. And then in verse 7, he wraps it up. We, we find these four statements together. The first and the last mirror each other, and the middle two mirror each other. That love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So that love bears and endures all things. Love doesn't give up. It's not easily dissuaded. It, it is able to bear the weight of relational strain, of conflict, and of sin, and of offense. That love bears up under the weight. It doesn't give up. It endures. It remains. That love believes all things, hopes all things. It is not to say that love is naive, but that love hopes for the best, love believes the best, rather than assuming the worst of other people, love believes the best of other people, believes all things, hopes all things. I don't know about you, when I read this description of love, I feel disappointment. Because I read this, and this feels impossible. Maybe you read this and you say, yeah, that's me. That's not me. I read this and I, I see all the ways that I'm not this. And so we say to Paul, well, Paul, if this is what love is. You're saying love is essential in the body. This, Paul, is impossible. I cannot do this. You are correct. You cannot do it and neither can I. That love requires not just that we die to self, but that we live to Christ. You will not love the way that God has called you to love in the body without Jesus. Now, love is able to write as if love is a person because love is a person. That there is only one person who's ever loved, lived and loved this way, and his name is Jesus. You can put his name in there. Jesus is patient and kind. Jesus does not envy and does not boast. Jesus is not arrogant or rude. He does not insist on his own way. But Jesus is not irritable or resentful. He keeps no record of our wrongs. That Jesus does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but always rejoices with the truth. That Jesus bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. That this is who Jesus is. And so that we die to self and we live to Christ. That, that Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That the only way we'll live this way and we'll begin to love this way is Christ in us, the Holy Spirit working through us. That this is what sanctification is. Sanctification is not the Holy Spirit helping you to be a better person. Sanctification is helping you, is the Holy Spirit in you, helping you to become a specific person. It is the conforming of your life into the person, the image of his son, that you might look more like Jesus, so that as you're shaped by the disciplines, by the word, by prayer, by the preaching of God's word, that you are shaped and molded to look more like Jesus, that you might begin to love this way. This is what God has called us to love. So maybe you say, well, I, I see what you're saying. But hey, I'm a Christian, and I have the Spirit, and I'm being sanctified, and yet it still feels like I fail at this. 
more than I succeed. I, I still feel like the, I fail more often than I actually get this right. Yeah, I think about that. I think about baseball. I'm not a big baseball guy, but one of the things I appreciate about baseball that I can uh, appreciate is that baseball factors in failure. It's just a part of baseball. I mean, Ty Cobb has the greatest batting average, uh, career batting average than anybody. He, he batted 366. If you're not familiar with that, that means that roughly about 36% of the time when he went up to bat, he got a hit 36% of the time. Which means the inverse is also true. That about 64% of the time that he went to the plate, he failed to get a hit. 1902 World Cups have the greatest winning percentage of any team in the history of baseball. They won 76% of their games. Which means that they lost 24%. They lost one, the greatest team in the history of baseball, lost one out of every four games. But yet in baseball, failure is factored in. When I read this text, I think about all the ways that I fail. You want to feel like a jerk? Spend a week preparing to preach 1 Corinthians 13. <laughs> and the Lord will expose all the ways that this is not true of you. I'm not the husband I want to be, the father, the pastor, the man, the disciple, the friend that I want to be. I'm happy most days to squeak out a single, right? A couple times in my life, I think I've hit a double. Reached third once on an error. But most days, most days, maybe you're like me, most days, I'm hoping to get hit by a pitch, right? I just... I want to just make it to base. It is hurt and I'm bad at it. I don't know what to do. You read this and you say, I can't do this. I failed too much. God has factored in your failure. That in baseball, when you fail, you don't give up. You don't get to quit. In baseball, you can fail a lot and still end up in the Hall of Fame. That God has factored in your failure. He knows that he is doing a work in you, a work that he intends to see through into completion. That he knows that you will fail, and yet he gives you time and time and chance and chance again that you might continue to love like Jesus. A few years ago, a study came out of Columbia University that said uh, roughly that they, they believe that if you could calculate that, that human beings, most the average person makes about 70 significant choices a day. It's about 490 a week, it's about 15,000 a month, about 180,000 for this year. Even if you bat 366, God will do a lot through you. God is gracious to give us more and more at-bats, to give us more and more opportunities as the Spirit works in us to transform us to look more like Jesus. That we read this and we say we don't do it well, but by the Spirit's help, we'll do the best we can. And God grows us in this. And so we ask, if this is so difficult and we're so bad at it, why press in? Why give our lives to this? Why strive for this? Why not just lean into the gifts? Why not just use the gifts that God has given us and not give so much care about love? Why is love the more excellent way? It's because love requires not just that we die to self and that we live to Christ, but when we love this way, when the Spirit works through us in this way, we display the gospel. That as we're sanctified to look more like Jesus, when this is true of us, that we display the love of Jesus, that we display the mercy and the grace that we have experienced, even in imperfect ways, we display it. And I want you to remember the context here. That Paul is not writing simply to individuals. He's writing to individuals who are members of a body, many members but one body. That we ought to be able to, if we're all being sanctified, if we're all following Jesus, not just put our name in there, but more importantly, we ought to be able to put our name in there. You know, Buck Run is patient and kind. Buck Ron does not envy or boast. We're just as happy about what God is doing at other churches than he is at what he's doing here. Buck Ron is not arrogant or rude. We do not think more highly of ourselves than we ought. The Buck Ron does not insist on its own way, but happily lays down its preferences for the sake of others. Buck Ron is not irritable and keeps no record of wrongs. We'll track your attendance, but not your grievances. The Buck Ron does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but always rejoices with the truth. Can we say that Buckron bears all things? Buckron believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And I ask you, what, what, what would God do with a body who lived this way? What would God do with a body, not just individuals, but collectively, a body, many members, one body, who said we are committed by the Holy Spirit to live and to love in the body this way? What would God do? in our church, in our community. I'll be honest, I think we're in a 
a season in which we're seeing some first fruits of that. As God is doing a work here, we're seeing people saved. God's working through us to reach people, to bring people to himself. We're seeing disciples made, people grow to, to be more like Jesus. That we're seeing some of the first fruits of what God is doing and will do with a church that says, we are committed not just to use our gifts and to pour out our bodies for the sake of the gospel, we are committed to love that we might display the gospel, that we ourselves might be a compelling testimony to the love and the mercy of Jesus. This is what love does. It it prioritizes motive over action. It it prefers others over self. I want you to notice here that Paul doesn't just describe the way for us, what it looks like, but Paul tells us where the way will take us. That the way of love, the road of love, is a long road, but it goes all the way home. The way of love is a long road, but it is not a dead end. The way of love takes us all the way to Jesus. Look at the way that that Paul ends this section. He says there in verse 8, love never ends. Love doesn't just care about motive over action, and love doesn't just prefer others over self, but love seeks and pursues the eternal over the temporary. And Paul says love never ends. And here in, in verses 8 through 12, what he's doing is comparing love with the gifts. And comparing how how long they last. How long does love last compared to how long the gifts lasted? And I want you to see here that he says the gifts are going to pass away. Love never ends, but all these gifts that you're fighting over, Paul says, they're going to pass away. But essentially, I want you to see that what Paul says is that gifts have an expiration date. The gifts are intended to one day pass away. Notice what he says there in verse 8. Love never ends. As for prophecies, you're fighting over these, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they too will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. All these gifts you're angry about, all these gifts you're jealous over and envious and boasting over, Paul says the gifts are passing away. I'm trying to show you the more excellent way, the way of love, for love never ends. And and following in verses 9 and following, what Paul does is to to take what he said in verse 8 and then to explain it using three different images. So he says in verse 8 that the gifts are passing away. In verse 9, he tells us when. That right now we know in part and we prophesy in part that, that all the gifts are partial. But he says that one day the perfect is coming. One day Jesus will come. One day all of this will be over and he will wrap up history and bring us all to himself. And he says, and when the perfect comes, then the partial will pass away. There's no need for the incomplete when the complete is here. He says that when he was a child, he spoke like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child, that the the gifts are the childhood. Paul says, but when I grew up, I put away childish ways. I became a man. I matured. Paul says that one day maturity is coming for the church in which we will put away childish ways. We will not need the gifts anymore. That they will pass away. That he says in verse 12, one day, now we see as in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. That we know in part, but then we will we'll know fully, even as we have been fully known. That Paul says right now, that by the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, by the Spirit works in the church, that we see, but we see dimly as in a mirror. But he says, one day the mirror will be gone. And that one day Jesus will come. When the perfect comes, we will see him face to face. We will be as he is. We will know him and be fully known. That that Paul is saying the perfect is coming. The gifts will one day pass away. Listen, everything you do in the kingdom of God, every gift that God has given you to use for the sake of the kingdom will one day pass away. That it is all temporary. But your love is not. That something better is coming. That one day when Jesus comes and he brings his kingdom and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And he writes every wrong and ends history and brings us to himself. Everything we've done for him will pass away. We will no longer have any gifts to give. But instead we will see him face to face. That that means right now in the here and now your love is a foretaste of heaven. Not your gifts. Your love is a foretaste of heaven. That when we love each other, when we love this way within the body, that our love in in these small, seemingly insignificant ways is proof that eternity is reaching back into the here and the now. For the gifts have an expiration date, but love never ends. If we're honest, if we live long enough and the Lord tarries, all of us will live to see a day in which our gifts will become obsolete. Right, if we live long enough, I pastored long enough and preached enough funerals to know that if you live long enough, life has a way of simplifying itself down to a 10 by 16 room in which everything you have is in that room. And you lose often your words and your memory 
and anything you had left to give. And you now are no longer to serve others, but, but now you are in a place where everyone is having to serve you. And it feels like you've got nothing left to give. You know, I think about that day a lot. Maybe that's a morbid thought, but I do. I think about if the Lord is kind enough to let me live to be that, that, that long, let me live to see that day. I, I wonder what that day will be like for me. The Lord called me when I was 12 years old. I preached my first sermon when I was 12. Don't be impressed by that. It was bad. It was a bad sermon. There are a lot of maybe still bad sermons. But for a long time, for the majority of my life, I've known that this is what I wanted to do. I was 12 years old and realized that preaching, this is what I want to give my life to. I want to pour myself out for the kingdom in this. That there is nothing in all the world I take more joy in and an activity for the kingdom than preaching, than serving the Lord. I, I love to serve God. I want you to know I love to serve him, not just the church in general, but I, I specifically count Bucker on to be a, a gentle mercy of God in my life. I love serving God here. And yet some days I think about what will it be like that if I live long enough, one day I'll have no more words. That one day I'll preach no more sermons. One day I may even lose the memory, not just my uh, memory of the word, but one day I might even lose memory of my family. That one day I will have nothing left to give. That one day my gifts will all be gone and I'll lie there with nothing left to give. But what? I'll still have love. And so will you. And when it seems that you have nothing left to give and all your gifts pass away, Paul says, but love never ends. I am not my gifts. I am not righteous before the Lord based on the quality of my last sermon. I am righteous before the Lord because Jesus loved me and gave himself up for me. Love never ends. Let the Lord take my gifts. I'll keep the love. Paul says your gifts have an expiration date, but your love never ends. So now, faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. But one day, faith will see and hope will be realized. One day, what we've trusted in without seeing, we will see. But now we believe even though we have not seen. We believe even though we have not touched. But one day, we will see Jesus. We will see him as he is. And, and John says, we'll be like him. We'll be able to touch and feel and hand him. We'll be with Jesus. Faith we'll see. And hope will be realized. All that we've hoped for, all that we've longed for, the, the coming redemption will come in its fullness. It will no longer be hope. It will be realized in its fullness. Faith will see and hope will be realized. But love will still be the more excellent way. The greatest of these is love. And so pour out your life for the kingdom. Use your gifts that the Spirit has given you to the best of your ability. Seek the lost. Disciple the saved. Pour out your life for Jesus. But, but can I show you a more excellent way? The way of love. We don't just need your gifts, we need your love. So by the help of the Holy Spirit as we pour out our lives, let us follow all the more excellent way.